Hey everyone, I'm Rick Beato on today's Everything Music. It's What Makes This Song Great, episode 66. The band is Metallica and the song is Master of Puppets. Coming up next. Master of Puppets was released on March 3rd, 1986. It was their third album and their first for Elektra Records. It was co-produced by the band and Fleming Rasmussen and was the final record that Cliff Burton appeared on about six months before his death. Master of Puppets was one of four huge thrash metal records, classic records, that were released within a one-year period by the four seminal bands of thrash metal. You had Master of Puppets in March of 86, Peace Sells But Who's Buying by Megadeth in September of 86. Then you had Rain and Blood in October of 86 by Slayer. And then on March 22nd, 1987, you had Among the Living by Anthrax. So these four huge underground thrash metal records actually brought thrash from the underground into the mainstream of metal. Let's take it from the top of the song. I want to talk about some of the devices used. It's not going to be a tutorial on how to play the song, although I will play the different parts, but I want to talk about the things that make the song great. So it starts out with this intro. And into the rim. Now, I read an interview with the producer, Fleming, who engineered it, and he talked about the fact that they actually tracked this with the tape slowed down and their instruments tuned down so that when they sped the tape back up, everything sounded tighter and faster. And I really don't doubt that. So this riff is a descending chromatic scale. <laughs> So what's cool about this riff is that, first of all, they're doing all downstrokes. Now, I can't do all downstrokes anymore. I used to be able to, but it hurts my thumb too much to do it. So I'm alternate picking, but they're definitely doing... That's the riff, but it's hard to play. The great thing about the bass and drums is that they provide the accents in the intro that make the guitar riff sound even more exciting. Along with the bass and drums is that there's a stereo pair of guitars that come in that play those accented power chords, the D, D flat, C. Let's check it out. So right there, if I just isolate those guitars, You can hear them come in there. Now listen with the bass and drums again. There's nothing on those when it does a dun dun on the tonics. There's nothing that goes with that. Listen. Here's the build up into the second riff. Next, I want to talk about what I'm going to call main riff number two. That's this one. Once again, you have those guitars that come in and play the... Along with a stereo pair of guitars, but that riff... That does what I call a line cliche. It's just like James Bond, right? Let me play it for you slowly. Double up in the B, then open. So it's, it's kind of chugging with the palm mutes, and then on the... You have that second pair of guitars that come in that play it open. Make it sound really exciting when the bass and drums come in on those. Next, we have the entire band to enter with the full-on drum groove, but play, still playing that main riff number two. But I want to isolate the bass and drums for a second, so check it out. Yeah. 
You notice that the bass is not playing the exact riff of the guitars. It's actually really cool what he's playing, what Cliff Burton's playing. Check it out. What's interesting about this is you can tell he's a fingers player. And when you hear those fingers, you get this certain harmonic sound. He's playing with, with a really um, gritty sound, but there's these uh, overtones that you get from playing with the fingers and digging in, and it makes it sound more aggressive. Let me play it with the drums. I'm just going to add one guitar to it on the left. Listen to it. You, you can hear it clear. Listen. <laughs> I really think that that actually gives that part, makes it even more hip. Because the guitar, you can actually hear that line cliche moving because the bass is not getting in the way of it. But the bass is driving it in a really unique way. This is the really great part about Cliff Burton's bass playing is that he knew how to play along with a riff without doing the exact doubling. He knew when to double it and he knew when to not do it. If he played that lick in unison, which he easily could have, it would have been mush. And he knew that. And that's those are the kind of things that, that great bass players know. They know when to double the guitars, especially in fast riffs like that. On fast riffs, the bass would actually weigh it down and not make it have that power that it has. Let's solo the drums for a second and listen to what Lars is playing. I remember when Master of Puppets came out, this particular drum groove at the time when I heard it and now always reminded me of the police because of all the upbeat accents. There's an article that I read where Kirk Hammett says, we discovered Kate Bush around the same time and we love the police. We listen to the police all the time because Cliff was a big fan of, of Stuart Copeland's drumming. He loved the sound of his snare and he said, oh, I love that snare. Well, check out the drums of Synchronicity 1 by the police. I put them back to back with the drum part of this section of Master of Puppets. And you can hear what I mean by that. Now, obviously, the music is very different. But you can hear that influence, or at least I can, of the Stuart Copeland drumming coming through Lars's drum part. And it might have been something that Cliff suggested there. Next, I'm going to talk about this little break that happens right here. Sounds like he's playing between the open E, that fretted E on the A string, and then the B flat on the D string. And then we're into the verse. There's a lot of talk about what time signature is happening in here. It starts out in four, but then there's this. Check it out. Check it out. Okay, let's just isolate the bass and drums and see if we can actually see what this rhythm is. To me, it sounds like it's just felt, like it's not counted. Let me count with it. Then. When you put the guitars in, it's, it actually smears a little bit. It's harder to tell what the time is. Because the distortion's hanging over, it's harder to tell what the rhythm is. Let me count it with the distortion. Two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, one, and a two, and one. The problem is that both those snare hits are a little bit ahead of where they should be. It's like a superimposed metric modulation right there, if you want to look at it that way. But when they're playing it, they're just feeling it. This isn't a prog Metallica that you're hearing here. This is just, they felt 
Like they want to play that riff like that and it sounds great. Here's the guitarist isolated in this section. <laughs> Let's talk about the verse melody now. So the verse melody is played over the open low E string on the guitar and bass. And then the riff happens in the breaks. Listen. Riff. Riff. Except for right there. And then he goes. And he ends on that ninth of the E of, of that key. But we only have those three notes. That's the, the melody shape that he's using. Now the verse modulates up a whole step. That riff modulates up to F sharp. And same riff, but up a whole step. And then let's check it out. So he's just singing on the tonic. And then the last note, he goes up to that high A, which is actually a really high note for James Hetfield to sing. There's a little build up on B just before the chorus next, and then the chorus riff. Here's the build. Chorus. It's great because he leaves those breaks for the audience to scream back at him. But the riff uh, comes in on E, um, then, then does that B to G, then. So this C to B gives you that upper neighbor tone to the dominant. And then you have, in power chords, you have the third of the B to the B, so it's like a 5-1 a cadence there. Right there is a great use of the flat too, when they do master and then to the F, up a half step to the flat too, that's total metal. You'll notice that the vocals are all double tracked in the chorus, as with many Metallica songs. Your life burns faster! Now, one of the great things about this song is the B part of the chorus. So you may say that this is actually the chorus where he actually uses the hook line, Master of Puppets. Well, what's going on here is a bunch of changing meters. Let me play it and I'll have the meters. I'll show you the meters in the corner, how they change. Check it out. I want to move ahead past the second verse and into the second chorus part here. There's a really cool Tom fill. Check it out. I love that. So clean. Perfect tuning of the toms too. Okay, next I want to talk about the breakdown and the vocal effect that leads into the breakdown. This is what I'm talking about. So the vocal keeps getting pitched down and then pans from speaker to speaker. It's a really cool transition into the picking section. Next, I want to talk about the guitar solo and the picking pattern. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on the guitar solo because it really speaks for itself. But there's a lot of cool changing meters that happens in the picking pattern. The picking pattern goes like this. <laughs> Let me count this with the track. Now it starts with a two four bar and immediately goes to four four. Let's check it out. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, 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 three, four. One, two, one, two, three, four. One, two. 
same pattern. These changing meters, they make it not mundane. It's really interesting because of that. And it makes it more progressive sounding. So the solo goes on with a dual lead, really well worked out. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure how much Cliff Burton had to do with this solo section, but I think he was really influential on the classical side of things with Metallica. And I'm wondering about his input into, into the solo section and this chord progression. I'm going to solo just his bass and the drums together and so you can hear what they sound like. Check it out. <laughs> Dead on with the drums, really interesting bass part that follows the guitar pattern perfectly. The bass and drums really start picking up with the build that happens here. Next, we have the chunking section, which begins on E and then moves up to the F sharp and G, occasionally throwing in that flat five, the C sharp. Check it out. Open up. So what, what they're doing here on this section, once it goes to F sharp, listen to the guitars. Those guitar tones are amazing. I want to talk about them for a second. Here's a page from the producer Fleming's notebook regarding the guitar tones and the song Battery. Now, since it's from the same album, I assume that the guitar tones, because they sound very similar, are identical to this. This is one of the Mesa Mark II amps. And as you can see from the picture, it shows you the graphic EQ, how it was set. So you're just doing a visual representation of it. And then you see the numbers there. Nine and a half, seven, two, four, four, five, three and three quarters, four and a half. Well, there are eight numbers there and those correspond with the eight controls on the Mesa. Okay, the circles around the seven, four and five, I assume mean that they are pulled out. Those particular pots have two different positions. So that's what I'm assuming on that. It looks like he was miking it with two different mics, an SM57, then it looks like a B&K mic. They have some EQ on them. Then he also has an Aphex EQ that was in the control room, I assume, and that has a little bit of EQ on it too. One thing that you have to realize, when you hear a guitar sound on a record, it's not just the guitar sound that was played in the room. It's been miked with multiple mics, and when you do that, the blend of them EQs it. Then you bring it into the console and many times you'll have an EQ on the console or you'll have an outboard EQ like here. And that creates the guitar sound. And then when it goes to mixing, Michael Wagner mixed the record, he might brighten the guitars up even more or add some 3K or something. So a guitar sound that you're hearing there is never the sound that was really coming off the amp, almost never. Okay, it's been altered in the studio. So never forget that when you're getting your guitar tones. A lot of times you're trying to match things 